So we're currently in a sermon uh, series titled Family Matters. Uh, I unpacked a little bit of why we're doing this. Uh, in, in short, uh, it's because uh, we are a family. Uh, we have been called into a family, uh, and God is our Father. And, and so there's a lot of things, uh, just like every family uh, that exists out here, there's a lot of things that we could unpack and talk about. Uh, and so we've decided to, to do three, uh, just uh, three things, and those are singleness, marriage, and parenting. Uh, and so last week we covered singleness. Uh, this week we're going to talk about uh, marriage, and then next week uh, we'll do parenting. And, uh, and what we do is we, I'll, I'll set it up a little bit up front. Uh, I'll be as quick as I can, and then we'll, we'll call uh, some folks uh, to come and sit on a panel. And uh, some of you have sent some questions, and we're very thankful for those. Uh, so even for next week, I'd encourage you at the end of this gathering to write out your questions about parenting and hand them over to the Sabona team uh, on your way out so that we can make our way through some of those uh, next week on parenting. But, uh, but thank you to everyone who sent in questions on marriage, and, and our hope is that our panel will kind of walk through some of that and we'll unpack a little bit about our own marriages and, and just marriages that we've been around. Uh, and the hope is that all of this would be to your benefit, that it would encourage you, uh, that it would point you to God, who is our Father in this incredible family. Uh, and so uh, today is marriage. Uh, before I jump in, permit me to pray. Uh, I'm going to pray for you, ask that you pray for me, that God would do a work that only He can do, uh, and that is to save many, uh, and then ultimately to heal, restore, reconcile uh, all those who are in need of that. And so, Father God, we thank you for uh, just your mercy and your grace, your goodness, your kindness to us. Uh, as we unpack marriage, Lord, I pray uh, that you would make it plain to us, uh, that we would understand uh, this uh, beautiful, beautiful thing called marriage and, and its purpose and, and, and what it's meant for, and uh, that ultimately all things point to you. Uh, God, we love you. Uh, we praise you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, right out the gates, I want to say this. I say this, in fact, uh, every single uh, wedding that I get to do, this is kind of how I introduce uh, what we are about to do. And here it is. Uh, marriage is not the invention of man. Now, it's important for us to know that, that marriage is not the invention of man. It is the creation of God, that we didn't come up with it. God did. Yeah. The design of marriage dwells deep within the purpose and plan of God. And because of that, marriage must honor God because it was created by God and for His glory. It's important that we understand that, that we must make that the foundation of this entire conversation. And so as in all of life, what matters most in marriage is God. That we have to come back to Him every single time. You see, Something fundamental changes when, when one man and one woman, and that's important, so when one man and one woman make a covenant with one another under God in this institution called marriage. Now, I know this is probably going against uh, popular culture belief or what people out there are saying, but, but, but the reality is that uh, it's one man and one woman who are entering into a covenant with one another under God. That's marriage. I know that we live in a world that uh, often, and, and these days it feels like it's happening more and more and more, that, that often undermines marriage that ridicules marriage. There's always a, a quick joke about marriage, and in some places doesn't even believe in marriage according to God's design. And so what we do is we say, no, 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 we, we, we own this thing called marriage. We created this thing called marriage, and so therefore we can decide how it is meant to exist. That is not the case. Because God created it, he has a design for it, and so therefore we must follow that design. Some people, some people treat marriage like a puppy. It's cute in the beginning, and then when you realize it comes with responsibilities, you're going, how do I give this thing back? Right? Like, that's how many of us tend to think about marriage. And again, that is, that is not in the design of God. That is not in the purpose and the plan of God. Like we mentioned last week, marriage is a gift from God. Designed by him, it is a gift from him. A gift that brings a, a new dynamic to one's life. 
that if you enter into this, this institution called marriage, that, that something fundamentally changes. There is this new dynamic in your life. Things cannot be the same. Let me explain. The Bible says that God gives a woman to a man to complement him. And the same thing happens the other way. We, we are different. And remember, different doesn't mean better. But we are different. And I know, again, we live in a world where we're like, that's not fair. Well, well, it's in God's design. If you have an issue with it, then you are to take it up with God. It doesn't mean that you can do whatever it is you want to do. We are different. We are meant to complement one another. And, and, and different here is a good thing. And, and somehow in God's sovereign providence, this works. This thing called marriage works. Somehow in, in, in God's plan and, and, and how he works it all out together, he brings one person and another person together and it works. That speaks of how good God is. And so married person in the room here today, I want you to know that your marriage was created by God, and so therefore we should come to him to, to understand how we are to navigate through it. The first marriage we see in the Bible is in, is in Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. Let me read it to you, verses 21 to 24. It says, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. Yeah, generally good things happen to us when we're sleeping as men, uh, as we will see here. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and hear this. And they become one flesh. They become one flesh. Many of us know John 3, 16, where it says, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. You see, for God so loved, he gave. For God so loved, he gave. He, he, he gave us so, so many incredible things he also gave us marriage. What a gift. What a gift. But, but in the context of marriage, and as we think about marriage, and as we think about John 3, 16, hear this. He, for God so loved, he, he not only gave, but he self-sacrificed. For God so loved, there was a cross. For God so loved, his son died on behalf of sinners. For God so loved. I'm, I'm trying to make the point here that, that, that our marriage comes from God, who is a good God and has provided everything that we need to navigate through this thing called marriage. Because we, we, we live in a world where everyone will tell you marriage is difficult. A and it is. It is. But God has provided. God has given us Everything that we need to be able to, to make sense of this and, and, and to navigate through it so that we might have a, not just a good marriage, but a flourishing one. Amen. God gives us his son. He gives us his son that we can press into, that we can lean into. The Bible describes the son as the groom. And the church is described as his Bride, And so we're taking this marriage thing a, li a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper here. The, the son expresses his love for his bride in self-sacrifice, in, in absolute self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice to the uttermost, a love that knows no end, a love that goes to the cross, dies, and is resurrected. You have to have that in your marriage if you're going to make it. See, the church expresses her love to the one that gives everything for her. But there is a response to this. There is a, a response to, to, to the church going, this is what Jesus has done for us. Why are you telling us this? Because if we understand that, we'll understand marriage. See, the, the bride joyfully submits to her loving head acknowledging him as her leader and following where he leads. 
Remember, I, I, I'm setting this up by going, there is Jesus and there is the church. There is Jesus and his bride. And if we need to understand this, if we're going to understand marriage. And so let me read this again. The bride joyfully submits to her loving head, acknowledging him as her leader and following where he leads. And before I get emails, <laughs> he leads her to Christ. He leads her in the direction of the good shepherd. Again, this is part of God's design. But if you still want to send me emails, no problem. It's wade at rootedfellowship.com. And as, as always, I cannot wait to read it. See, the, the, the marriage designed and created by God and lived out from him is, is a marriage that points to Jesus and the church. That, that, is, that is the point of your marriage. Now, there's a lot of great things included in that, but the, but the point of your marriage is to point to Jesus and the church. It's what we see in Ephesians 5, and I'll read that in a moment. You see, husbands, when you take a woman to be your wife, you have acquired a new responsibility. A responsibility that you've never had before. This, this woman is, is not just any woman. She is your bride. You are to love her to the point of absolute self-sacrifice. Your love is to know no end. You are her provider and her protector. Th this, is, this is why cohabitation cannot be counted as marriage. Yeah. And you can do all the biblical gymnastics you want. But, but it, it, it's not this. It does not point to Christ and the church. See, Jesus doesn't cohabitate with us. You are her provider and protector. I hope you're listening, gentlemen. See, in a, in a good situation, her father, who would have taken care of her up to that point, he, he, he should be able to sleep comfortably every night. He should be able to, to put his head on the pillow knowing that you, as the husband, will do whatever it takes to protect her and to provide for her for the rest of her life. In a good situation. And so husbands, you should make a plan for this. Wives, you should speak to your husband and go, hey, what is the plan for this? Again, Jesus has a plan. He does. Wives, wives should be able to sleep with a sense of peace that God has given her a provider and a protector. Now, having said that, let me chat to the ladies in the house, particularly those who are married. Wives, you need to know that your husband is no ordinary man. He's just not another guy. See, no one has forced you into this situation. Therefore, you are to joyfully submit to him, to trust him, and to follow his leadership. You chose him. Because we hear it all the time. Why would I follow him? I'm my own person. I can, like, you, do you realize you chose him? And, and, if, and if you sit here and you go, you know what? No, I love Jesus with all my heart. Then you've got to understand what his role is in your life. There's also a word for single ladies. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. See, the, the woman in marriage makes the decision 
that this man, my husband, will be my provider, my protector, and you are to love him through submitting to his servant leadership, supporting him and caring for him. Now, we'll get into it, don't worry, because I know people sitting here going, mm, but protected. No, I totally get it. You have a conversation together, you engage with one another, but that is the role that he plays in your life, and so therefore you have a role that you play in his life. We should hear and heed the words of God that are found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. Let me read it to you. It says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. See, it's in the word of God. I'm just, I'm just a mailman. Like some of you guys are already upset with me. Like you're, like, oh, you're already typing the email. Like just relax. I'm just a mailman. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. Since we are members of his body, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And here it is again. We saw it at the first marriage, and here it is. And the two will become one flesh. This mystery, so now Paul, Paul's going, let me explain to you what all of this is about. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. There it is. He goes, the point of your marriage is to point to Christ and the church, the marriage that exists between Christ and the church. That's the point. To, to sum, and he says, to sum up, each of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. You know, the marriage between a man and a woman is to be a living testimony of the relationship between the Lord Jesus Christ and his chosen people, yeah. his bride, his church, whom he purchased with his own blood. Therefore, listen up, therefore to be unfaithful to this marriage covenant will not just bring shame upon you personally, and lead to negative consequences in your life. No, no, no. To, to, to be unfaithful to this marriage co covenant will be to lie to the world about Christ and his church. It, it would be for you to say that Christ is not a faithful husband, that he does not keep his promises, and that the church does not trust Christ. That's ultimately what we're saying. To, to walk away from this marriage covenant would be to trample the very blood of Christ under your feet. That's how serious this is. And somehow we found ourselves, I'm talking about even in the church, we found ourselves going, you know, marriage is, you know, if you want it, it's cool. If you, if you want to do it, no problem. You, you know, it's up to you. You do you. You know, it's, your marriage is confidential. So you can do whatever you want. We're not going to get involved no. Like as a church, we should be like, you know what? Listen, when, when you go against God's design, you are presenting to the world. You, you're, you're trying to say like God is a liar. And then on top of that, you're going, hey, like what we're doing is not real. That's how serious like the, the accountability in the church should be with regards to marriage. But we've signed up to what the world says. Wives, in, in this covenant, you should know that you are beautifully adorned in splendor. Pointing to the reality that the Lord Jesus Christ has clothed his church. He has adorned her in the robes of his righteousness. What does this mean? Well, well it means Christ does not embarrass his bride. Christ does not ridicule her. Christ does not speak evil of her. And so husbands, you shouldn't either. 
Scripture says this, Revelation 19, verse 6 to 8 says, Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like sound of cascading waters, and like the rumbling of loud thunder saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure. Now, I don't know, ladies, if this is a reason for you to say to your husband, I think I need to go get some new clothes. (laughs) Maybe you could use your discretion. For the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. See, if... If you are married, you need to know that your marriage exists because of the gospel. It's important that you know that and that it must be built upon the gospel. Your your marriage is is, is not to say to the world, I hope you're you're not hearing this, it's it's not to say, look at us, a perfect couple. That's not what I'm saying. But rather to say to the world, look at us, two people who are sinners and are in desperate need of grace. Grace. And oh, what joy, because we have found that grace in Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our only hope now and forever. He is the great promise keeper, and his promises will all be fulfilled. Every promise in Jesus Christ is yes and amen. That's what your marriage should put on display. Let me read one more passage. And we'll unpack a little bit more in the panel. And I could have read many more, many more passages, but let me read this one. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. I think it's important for our time to hear this one. It says, marriage should be honored by all. By all. That means married people leave all other people alone. Shut it down. Some of you need to delete your Instagram. Some of you need to find a a different place to have lunch. Some of you need to go to HR and be like, I'd like to be removed from this cubicle, please. It's, It's that serious. Should be honored by all. That also means single people. Leave married people alone. And the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Let Let me close with this and then I'll call the panel up. See, in in your marriage... Married folks, in your marriage, you choose each day, every day, you are choosing never to pursue any other. But together you pursue Christ. You are uniquely God's gift to one another to become one flesh, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So therefore, honor your marriage. Fight for your marriage. Cherish your marriage. And serve one another in your marriage. In doing so, you will glorify God in your marriage and you will find absolute joy in it. Now I could unpack each one of these. Honor your marriage, fight for your marriage, cherish your marriage, but I'd rather have us do that in our panel. And so this morning... Uh, we have uh, a return panelist. Um, if I can, uh, Senator, do you mind grabbing those stools, please? Thanks, my champion. No, it's not because you're single. <laughs> it's, it's definitely not because you're single. It's because you're strong. I mean, I, I, I surveyed... I, no, it's not. No, 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 no. Can, 
Do you, guys, do you guys mind putting them up front here? It's not up, up, up front here. It's not, it's, I promise you, it's not, because, it's not because you're single. Let me put this one here. I, I, it was a matter of strength because I looked at who you were sitting next to and then I compared and I said, no, when it comes to strength, you are by far, by far the stronger one. Do you understand? I don't know why people are laughing. I feel like it's obvious, but anyway. Um, no, so we, we have uh, my, my bride, um, my wife, uh, and uh, uh, to many of you, uh, she's Mamruti, she's, uh, yes, yes, we, and uh, she kind of oversees uh, the, the women's discipleship here at Ruji Fellowship, um, so confidence, would you please come up? Um, yeah. And then this week, um, we have... Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I'm great. Uh, we have uh, uh, an elder couple here at, uh, at Rooted Fellowship. Uh, you guys, I'm 100% sure you know them well. Um, I almost said doctor, but that would be true. <laughs> let, let me leave it. Uh, elder, elder Mongani Mobaso and his wife, um, Olebocheng Mobaso. You guys can come up, please. And then, uh, would you mind grabbing this one? Yo, I'm pretty sure like I'm gonna cause massive damage here and electrocute someone. There we go. But I've been told that if, if that were the case, before you go out, you must just shout out to Libus Christ. All right, all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, um, guys. These are incredible human beings. Uh, they serve the church, not just as an elder couple, but uh, in so many different ways. Uh, Bongani, uh, as you guys know, preaches uh, here and does so uh, faithfully. Um, he's also, for a very long time, ran uh, the Salbona team. Um, so if you're part of the Salbona team, you know him, you know this face. Uh, Mulebohing serves in our children's discipleship. Uh, department in various ways um, and has been doing that for a very, very long time. And uh, uh, if you have a little one, you should be very thankful for the work that she does here. And that's on top of many, many other things. They lead a family group, um, they disciple people, uh, they are involved in the life uh, of Rooted Fellowship. Uh, but they also married um, and have uh, been so for quite a while now and, uh, and have a lot of wisdom um, and experience uh, as they continue to pursue Jesus. Um, in their marriage. Cool. So we're going to, let, let me jump in maybe with some, um, some interesting ones. <laughs> Easy ones. Then we'll go to the hard ones. Because uh, you guys ask hard questions. Um, so here's an easy one. Well, actually, hold on. Let me just do this. H how long have you guys been married? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. We've been married 13 years this year. Yeah. Is, that, is that correct? Is that, because if you got it wrong, then you would be removed from this panel. You would have to start again. All right, 13, 13 years. Beautiful. Um, here's a question. What, what thing or things about your spouse do you find irritating? It's an easy one. We're starting easy. Um, but, but, but over the years, you've realized, you've realized that that's actually been, that thing is actually a very good thing for, for you and for your marriage. <laughs> or should I go? <laughs> no problem. I'm not shaking, it's just cold in here. <laughs> um, so, so as someone who... Like, I work, I work a lot and I work hard. And uh, there's a... <laughs> that's good. Yeah, you got to start with the positive before you go to the negative. Uh, the problem with that is that I run the risk of idolizing work. Um, I don't like to take breaks at all. Um, I, to a large extent, or at least for a very long time, used to consider them weakness. 
And, uh, and my wife being more black and white than I am, I exist in the gray. Um, not when it comes to God's word, so if you're visiting, just <laughs> calm down. Um, but, uh, but my wife is, is really good at like, no, being hard on certain things, like we need to take a break. And for a very long time, I would say in the, only in the last two years, maybe I've stopped uh, complaining about uh, taking a break and going on holiday uh, to the point where it actually, I could see it was becoming frustrating uh, for my wife. Um, but what I've learned is when we're away, I'm like, this is actually good for me. Um, in so many ways, this is good for me, it's good for our family, um, it's good for our marriage, um, but it's that thing that I'm constantly trying to fight, and, and to a large extent, I would, would find it irritating. I'd be like, why do we have to do this now, and why do we have to take a break now, and why do we have to go for so long, and why do we, um, but I've realized, like, the, the Lord, I'm so thankful to the Lord giving me someone who's not only persistent, but actually loves doing these things, and is really good at them, um, so that's, I would, I would say, I'd say that. Yes, yeah. I'm very good at them. Um, Shoman would be when we're traveling together um, she says everything like documents are like it's an order to everything like this at this time at this he looks like five minutes ETA we're going to do this and this time and I'm just like we're traveling let's relax like <laughs> I it's a lot like it's like he's thought about what he's going to say when he gets to this place and, so, and I'm like it's so intense um, but the good thing is, I think after I actually forgot my <coughs> passport once, um, I realized how important it is that he actually puts all the documents in a row, do you have this, do you have that, because, yeah, I almost didn't make it to a, a trip with him. But, I, yeah, I was okay, you know? I'm a big girl, so I would have accepted my consequences, but I'm thankful that he does that. Now I'm like, let's take everything. Yes, yes, yes. What time? Okay, yes. <laughs> So, I'm very thankful. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, you know, I, I just want to be clear that it no longer irritates me. I don't want, yes. <laughs> I don't want to go back home and people are angry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay, so, um, uh, I think it's like the, the typical guy stuff, you know, like leaving clothes on the floor and towels and things like that. Um, it used to really just grate me so much, but I've learned, um, yeah, it's not a sin thing, right? It, it really isn't. Like, I know it's I'd not. like to make it into one, but it, it, it really isn't a sin thing. It's more of a preference thing, you know, um, and yeah, so I've just learned to either pick it up myself or thank God we have a, a domestic worker. So if I don't do it, then I know she will. And it's like, you know what, you don't have to pick fights about silly things. It's like, it's the far worse things that a person can do than leave a towel on the floor. And Shami doesn't do it as much as well. Like, it's, get, it's getting better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, airing dirty laundry. <laughs> Very early. <laughs> Like literally. <laughs> um, do I have anything that used to annoy me and now doesn't? I don't. Um, yeah, she's perfect. Um, so I, I'm definitely a, a thinking person. I'm also, you know, like yeah, I, things are objective. You know, it's black and white. My wife is definitely a feeling person. Um, so you know, we feel everything before we do anything. You know? <laughs> so, um, and that used to annoy me. I mean, it's like, I just want to do it, you know? Like, yeah, okay, there's a problem. We've identified it now. Let's, let's fix it. Um, you know, we don't have to beat around the bush. But she wants to feel it for five weeks, and then, and then we can, uh, you know? Maybe that one still annoys me. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I've learned to appreciate that, you know, you don't always have to just do. You can also be. You know, mm. like be in a situation. And I think that's made me a better, even a leader at work. Because, I mean, I'm like, a, I don't know if you, if you guys do Enneagram. I'm an eight on the Enneagram. So trust me, feeding is not a thing we do a lot. But like people are like, oh man, yeah, you're such a caring leader. I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's all her, right? So, so I think that's kind of how that shaped me. Beautiful. But that, it definitely used to annoy me. Beautiful. I told you guys we're starting light. Um, Maybe, maybe real, real quick, uh, and then we'll get into like the questions. Is um, 
you know, I think the, the perception sometimes can be that marriage is not fun. And, uh, and I think even in the church, like uh, I've heard it a few times. In fact, maybe I think there was a time where I used to say that when I was single. It's like, man, I don't think these people are having fun. Uh, and so I don't know if I want to get married. And, uh, but we have a lot of fun uh, as, as married folks. Why, why do you look concerned? No, I'm not concerned. I'm saying we have a lot of fun. Um, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. One of them we can't talk about here. Uh, we can't. Uh, but, but maybe what, what, what fun thing do you guys love doing? Um, what, what, you know. We're keeping it uh, PG, right? 100% PG. Uh, is, uh, okay. Um, I th- lately, we've, we've, we've gotten into running together, and then the kids ride, ride bikes ahead of us. I, I love that. Uh, I think it's like a family bonding time. And it, I just feel like it's, I mean, I hate running, right? Like, I'm not a, I'm not a runner. I love golf, I love cycling, but I hate running. But like I feel like if I'm running with them, it's 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 very easy. So we we do that. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's like a nice bonding time. Very cool. Thanks. Maybe we should answer that one. <laughs> so, so we love. I, I think I'm gonna say traveling together. Not so much the the transportation part. Uh, that part we don't. Uh, it's lots of. <laughs> uh, but uh, but once we're there, I think we really love new experiences. I th- we love. Uh, sharing those experiences together, uh, whether it's a new place, whether it's a, a, a meal, or uh, we just, yeah, there's experiences and we get to talk about them, and um, they really shape us in so many different ways, and so I would say that's, that's a lot of fun for us. Whenever we can, we try to, we try to do that together. Um, what's a new restaurant? What's a new uh, city? What's a, yeah, so, uh, so there's lots of fun that happens here. Great. You, okay, cool. You wouldn't add to that. Um, okay, well, I just wanted to, to ask those questions so you guys get a feel of who we are. And, um, let, let me start with these, and then we'll kind of shift a little bit into marriage, because there was a few questions asked about divorce. Okay, so we're talking marriage, but, but what about divorce? And, and there's quite a few. You know, what are the grounds for divorce? Uh, does God tolerate it? That was one of the questions. Is, uh, is, it, is divorce unforgivable? Um, you know, ca- can you remarry after divorce? Uh, what does the Bible say? And this, let, let me s- set it up here a little bit, and then we can dialogue if necessary. Um, the, the, this is quite a, it's quite a sensitive topic, um, and I want to carry that, that level of sensitivity, that level of, of care. And at the same time, I want to be able to carry God's word, uh, because God's word is true. Um, and so I want to be able to communicate with conviction. Um, and, and so when we talk about divorce, uh, we, we're navigating biblical theology, right? So what does the Bible say? And then gospel discipleship, all right? So how are we going to navigate through this? Because it's very, very complex. And, and there's a tension that exists in between that, all right? Um, and I call that tension grace. And if you don't feel that tension, then <laughs> sometimes I go, you, you don't fully understand grace. Because there is tension there. Like, for example, how can a holy God forgive an unholy people? Like, and repeatedly. Like, there's tension there, right? So, so... Um, so biblical theology and, and, and gospel discipleship. Um, right out the gates, let me say this, right? God hates divorce. Yeah. He hates it. He absolutely hates it. Uh, Malachi 2.16 is very clear on this. Yeah. It's a thus says the Lord kind of verse. He, I, I hate it. And that's because it was never part of his design. Yeah. Divorce was never part of his design. The two become one. In fact, Jesus brings it up in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount. He's like, that that which God has put together, nobody separates. So God hates divorce. Now, having said that, uh, if you read the Bible, you'll see that that God does permit it. God does give grounds for divorce. It's what what we call God's permissive will, right? If we want to be technical here. We call it God's permissive will. And again, that's, that's the tension. It's like, well, God hates it, but then he does give grounds for it. How? That middle tension that you feel is grace. Now, what are the grounds for divorce? Well, they're, they're given to us. We can read about them in Deuteronomy 24. You can read about them in Matthew 5, Matthew 19, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Right? They're given to us by Moses, by Jesus, and by Paul. And so these are pretty legitimate people giving us these. Um, and, and so here they are. There are three. So here at Root of Fellowship, we would say... There are three. I've preached on this uh, over the years. Uh, you can find it uh, on a sermon in, uh, that we did when we walked through 1 Corinthians, and then you can also find it when we walked through the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and so there are three grounds for divorce here. The third one is kind of tied to the second one, uh, but because of the debate that's happening in 
Christianity, we found it necessary as the elders here to pull it out and make it a third. And so the grounds for divorce are adultery, abandonment, and then the third one that we pulled out of abandonment is ongoing unrepentant abuse. You can think about it as the three A's or triple A if you want to remember it. Adultery, abandonment, and then ongoing unrepentant abuse. Those are the grounds that the Bible gives for divorce, okay? Now, now, now here's the thing. Um, the, the hope that the gospel wants for us is always reconciliation. Yeah. So repent, seek forgiveness, and then walk on a journey of healing so that you might be reconciled. That, that, is, that is always the hope for the gospel, and that is always the hope for us. But, but Jesus then says, all right, Jesus then says in, in Matthew 19, verse 8, he says, but, but God permits it, right? The reason he permits it is not because of him. It's because of us. It's because of the hardness of our hearts. So we're actually the problem here. It's not that God cannot reconcile. It's not that God cannot heal. It's because of the hardness of our hearts. We just don't want to. And, and look, again, I want to be sensitive because I realize that there is complexities here. Let's talk a little bit about those complexities. So as we talk about the grounds of divorce, right? Adultery, abandonment, and abuse. Notice what's not there. Irreconcilable differences. <laughs> it's a big one here. Not in the word of God. I don't love him anymore. Not in the word of God. Those are the only three. So in adultery, what the, the Bible goes on to say is... Only the person who the adultery has been committed against has grounds for divorce. So therefore, if I commit adultery, I have no grounds for divorce. I have no grounds for divorce. I must repent, seek forgiveness and reconciliation with every fiber of my being. But the one who the adultery has been committed against, they have grounds for divorce. But remember... As you lean into the gospel, the hope is that you would find a place to forgive and to seek healing and reconciliation. But if it doesn't, okay, fine. The Bible gives grounds for divorce. Now, if the person who the adultery has been committed against goes, I don't want a divorce. I want to fight for this marriage. I want to stay in this marriage because I believe it's a covenant. Then the person who committed the adultery, if they decide to leave, if they get married then they, with that other person, have committed adultery. I hope this makes sense. Right? It's technical, but I'm trying to be as quick and brief as I can. They have committed adultery because the person who did not commit adultery wants to stay and fix the marriage, but the person who committed the adultery is the one that wants to go. And if they get remarried, then the person that they got married to, now that person has committed adultery. Do you see the, the gospel discipleship necessary for this? It's so complex but that's what the Bible says. Now, if a person dies, this isn't divorce, I just want to put it out there because it came up in one of the questions. No, then, then, then you can remarry. Paul, Paul, Paul puts it out there. Though he says he prefers that you stay single because of what we spoke about last week, but he's like, it's fine. You, you can get remarried. It's the same for abandonment, but again, here, like, you can't be like, I've been abandoned, and it's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Where did he go? No, he's gone. He's, he's around the corner. He's just, it's like, okay, hold on. Let's, let's talk about this. Let's, let's walk through this. Let's, you know what I mean? But, but there is a case there for abandonment. And then ongoing unrepentant re- abuse. Because you've abandoned your post as a spouse. And you are unwilling, unwilling to repent and seek reconciliation and to seek help. Which is what we want to do as a church. We want to both protect so if you are going through that, I need, I need you to hear me. Come and speak to one of the elders or, or elder wives here. Like, we, we want to protect you. But we also want to provide. We want to provide means of, of like, how do, how do we get out of this? How, is there a reconciliation possible here? So, so I just wanted to put that out there so that you know that this is what the Bible says on divorce and remarriage. Uh, let me say this real quick, and then I'll, we'll dive into some maybe dialogue here. Is um, well, what what happens? Because it came up, and and I I would put it here. What happens if I've married? How do I know that I've married the wrong person? Let me phrase it that way, because that's how it was 
offer to us. How do I know I've married the wrong person? If, if you marry a non-Christian, someone who is not a believer, who does not trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, you've married the wrong person. So just put it out there. You've married the wrong person because you cannot be unequally yoked. Yeah. Now, if you're sitting here going, oh, I married the wrong person, that means I can get out. No. <laughs> you can't, right? Paul, Paul, Paul goes, no, can't do it. Yeah. What happens in that situation, you've entered into a covenant, so you stay in that covenant. Now that person, your spouse, who's not a Christian, now becomes your one more yeah. because you are the closest person to them to show them the love of Jesus. And so so Paul says, now it's an opportunity for you to to show the grace of the gospel. Stay in that marriage, don't leave. But then Paul does say, if that unbelieving spouse then goes, you know what, you go to church too much, it's not my vibe, I'm out. Then then Paul says, okay, then you're not bound. Let them go. That ends the covenant, it dissolves the covenant. And then you can remarry. So those are the grounds. I hope I'm as clear as I can. If I haven't, go listen to the sermons uh, in those two series. And then again, you're more than welcome to uh, send us questions. But but maybe some thoughts. If you guys have some further thoughts, some questions, uh, just a little bit on on that whole thing of divorce and remarriage. Um, Let's dialogue a little bit about that, and then we'll we'll transition back into marriage. Maybe a quick question that I might want to ask you is, um, should... Should people be looking for opportunities of being missionaries then? Because then just marry him or her, and yes. then I'll be, they'll be my one more after that. <laughs> yes. That is a great question. And it's an easy answer. No. <laughs> you cannot cover a sin with a sin. See, g- grace, grace does not protect sin. Grace protects the sinner. You need to hear that. Grace does not protect the sin. It protects the sinner. You know what sin gets? Sin gets the full wrath of God. And and, and grace is Jesus. You cover yourself in Jesus and the full wrath of God hits you. And you come out and you're like, what? Nothing happened. It's grace. But you cannot cover sin with sin. Romans 7 tells us this. Because you might be sitting here going, oh, but then, you know, and we said that it's a missional opportunity and, you know, I'll, I'll be the closest that they can get to Christ. <laughs> like, Paul says, if, if that's the way that you think, because grace abounds and that means can I continue sinning, see, you, it's quite possible that you're not a Christian. It's quite possible that you're not a Christian. It's, it's that serious. So the answer would be no. Yeah. Anybody thinking that? Yeah, 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 delete, delete. <laughs> cool. Any other thoughts or anything before I, everyone happy? Okay, great. Um, so maybe just on that, uh, look, none of us have been married before, but we've walked with people who, who have been married before. Oh, let, let, look, let me say this. Let me say this. And I didn't say it and I should have. I also want you to know, if you're sitting in, your, in any one of those positions with regards to uh, divorce and adultery, you know, I, I need you to know that that God is gracious. So, so even if you hear that, you're like, Oof, am I, like, like you might be, have the, the one who committed adultery and you've remarried and you're like, oh, now what do I do now? Repent and seek God's grace. Yeah. I, I don't believe that you should get divorced. No, I, I think you come, the, the blood of Jesus covers, yeah. but there's a lot of discipleship things that you need to do. Yeah. There are conversations you need to have. Yeah. That you need to reach out to people and, and seek forgiveness and reach out. Like, you cannot do this in isolation. That's the other thing. I hate it when people are like, my marriage is confidential. I hate that. I hate it. Absolutely hate it. Why? Because Satan loves it. He loves the shadows. And so when you read this stuff, I can't imagine. I mean, Moses must have been sitting there the whole day, case after case, the complexity of it. And he's going, I've got to apply God's word, and I've got to hear out the complexity of what's going on here. Okay, cool. And then I hear, and then I place you with someone that can walk with you and disciple you and be like, this is what you need to do. You need to phone this person. You need to, they, they, mm, I, can, I can hear that there's still some anger and bitterness here. You're not ready to get remarried. Let's sort this out first. Okay, so I just want to know, God's gra- there is more grace in Jesus than sin in you. Yeah. Amen. So good. But you've got to lean into the grace. Yeah. 
sorry, I just needed to put that out there. So none of us have been married before. We've walked with people who have. Um, so maybe what, what are some possible challenges uh, for people who are kind of walking through a second marriage or want to enter or, yeah, quite possibly enter into a second marriage? What, what are some foreseeable challenges uh, that maybe we've seen in our counseling times together or friends that we know? Any thoughts? Are looking at me, um, so yeah, this is a. It's it's not easy. In my family, it's happened, um, you know, quite a number of times. In fact, polygamy as well also kind of comes into that picture. So if you if you've been married before mm. and you are still married and then you marry again, you know, that's like another uh, situation. I think many uh, people, you know, probably come from environments like that. Um, one of the biggest challenges is. If there were kids before or no kids before, sure. I think that's an issue and a conversation that needs to be held uh, and had. Um, and I saw that with my aunt, um, where things were not discussed and they became issues later. And then secondly, you're so used to things being a particular way. You know, So now you are married and for whatever reason, good or bad, you are divorced and now you remarry. But actually you're still trying to fix the things that were broken in the old one. And so you kind of find that in the new one. Mm. Uh, and so it ends in a second divorce. Sure. And then you can kind of see the pattern, right? It becomes a third marriage, a fourth marriage, a fifth marriage. Like if, if that happens, there's an issue you haven't dealt with. Mm. And you just keep repeating it over and over again. So I, I would start there. That's good. Maybe even connected to that, kind of let's turn a corner here and talk of just marriage. But... Um, you know, we, we, we've benefited, and maybe I'll use that term, I use it very lightly, from being, getting married young. We got married young in our lives. Um, to, I mean, we, I, you know what I brought into the marriage? Other than love <laughs> and tenderness. And I brought a second-hand couch that I bought at an auction and a microwave that my mom bought me when I was still a student, which lasted us many years. I love that couch. It's a, it's a phenomenal, we still have that couch today. Um, but, but maybe, what, 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 are, what are some, some things to look out for? What are some challenges for folks who get married later in life? Um, maybe the, the career has grown, um, they've acquired certain assets, they've, they've lived, they've, and they get married later. What, what are some things to look out for in, in, those, in that situation? I think one of the things that I always, I mean, this question when you ask young versus old, what's young and what's old, you know, I think that also varies because I, I mean, we got married when we were 25, I think, 25, 26. Um, I, I was 25. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. Um, I think if, everybody should speak for themselves, but I, <laughs> no, I was 25. This is who I live with. Um, I would, I mean, however, yeah, 14, 15 years later, I still don't, I don't think that's young. But some people really think that's very young. So people, so I, I mean, I think then the question is what's young and what's old. I'd say, I think in our 20s, we're a bit more, I think, flexible uh, because we are still figuring out life. Like we're new, like new in our careers, figuring life. So if you're married early mm. or at the, or those ages, you're able to do that together mm. uh, and figure stuff out together and grow and climb together versus maybe later on where it's like I already have a schedule, I have already have things that I'm doing that I've developed in and I'm really good at and I still want to pursue that. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a very hard conversation to have about what are we compromising and what are we not compromising. Um, so I think, yeah, I think you're set in your ways. So it's, not, it's, it's never like a, uh, a wrong or right and it's actually not what I'm answering. I just, there's challenges that you're just aware of. And so even in your premarital prep or whatever counseling you're doing, just be aware that you most probably would wanna be cemented in some things. You're like, you don't, you're not willing to move easily. And so I think um, just getting the right counseling and talking about why, you know, and just mm. um, attending to the specific things. Cause those are naturally like that. Like you, you've done things, you've lived, you've been changing your tire as a woman for however many years. Like it's like, actually, I don't, I don't need anyone to help me with that. And so those are things where you kind of like, letting someone else and partnering with someone else. So I say, yeah, discussing the things that are cemented that mm. are becoming very hard to compromise or discuss or navigate. Can I just add as yes, well to that? 
Um, yeah, we got married quite young. Um, yeah, in our early 20s, so earlier than 25. I think I was 22 and you were 24. Um, yeah, and it was, it was great, but also difficult at the same time. Um, and I'm speaking now for myself. I don't know how to speak for you. <laughs> but I was, when I say I was immature, like, <laughs> I was super duper immature. Um, and so that's, and I, it's not to say that if you get married young, that young people are automatically immature. I've seen some really young people who are mature. But there is a, a, there is a bit of immaturity in you when you're a little bit more younger, um, which is not a, always a bad thing. I mean, you get to learn and grow and and the nice thing is that you get to learn and grow together. I mean, just to sort of piggy bank on what you're saying, um, when you get married a little bit later in life, you are more set in your ways. You've been doing things, you know, you've had your own fridge, your own furniture, now you've got to merge those two things. <laughs> Whereas when we got married, it was like, ah, I'm good with whatever you've got, and, you know, I'll bring whatever I've got. And, you know, we sort of grew our things together as we grew up um, together. Um, but yeah, there is that thing of, hey man, like it is, as Pastor Ones really said, it's, it's marriage is a very serious thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a great thing, but it's also not something to just jump into flippantly and just to assume that, oh, it will work out great because, you know, I saw it in a chick flick once and, you know, it's, it, it, you have to put a lot of work in and yeah, I think mm. immaturity can be a problem if you're not willing to do the hard work, if you're not willing to have those serious conversations, and I think that was where I was when we got married, very immature. Um, so yeah, I don't mm. know if that's answering the question. It's good. Uh, therapy, well, I don't know. No, <laughs> Somewhere good. in between there. Yeah, it, sure. Maybe I can, I can add to that. I think, I think the ladies have covered it well. Um, I would say just in terms of advice, I mean, if you get married young, like you can't do it on your own, be in community, you, you need to submit your marriage to, to, you know, to other, you know, maybe older married people that can advise you, guide you, uh, disciple you, counsel you, etc. I think doing that on your own is actually, you know, what is the status? Like most marriages don't make it past, is it two years or is it three years? Something like that. Yeah, two. Five years. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's actually very low eh, as a stat. I mean, that's scary. That's very, very scary. And it just shows you that, um, you know, there's, a, there's something wrong that we are doing when we get married. That, those first five years are very important. And I think if we didn't have people around us, mm. we would have got divorced, I, I would say. Like, because like our first seven years of marriage were not rosy. Like, they were really difficult. They were like really, really difficult. You know, like I was like, oh man, this is, this is, this is it. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you know, but, and then, you know, then you get challenged to go like, but you need to love like Christ. And what did Christ do? Like, he died for me when I didn't, I didn't want him. I didn't give him permission to die for me. He just did. You know, it's like, you know, and that's kind of like, you know, she, this person is not loving me the way I expected or respecting me the way I expected. And yet Christ is saying, you need to love her and die for her nonetheless. And that, that's like really tough. And I think to have someone else more mature to, to talk you through how you handle that uh, is amazing. But on the, on the, on the flip side of it, you know, it shows why God designed marriage the way that it did, because I think after seven years, we, it, for me, it's been like, I feel like we're in honeymoon kind of every day, you know? So it's because we've, we've gone through that. And I think sometimes we also end things too early because we don't work through them. We don't like really go into Ephesians 5 and go, what does it mean for me to die for my wife? It's really good. And, and what does it mean for me to, to submit to my husband and really like dig into that and, mm. and, and live in that way? So for us, the gold, we had to dig like, like to the cross of the earth and then we found the gold. You know, maybe for you, you find it at the surface. I don't know. You know, and, and, some, and, and it's different for different people. Sometimes the first two years are amazing. You find gold, then you hit like rocks, and then you find gold again. But like the, the templates are very different, right? Because we're different people. But I think the point is Ephesians 5 is the template. Like it works. It, it is the way that God has designed it. It may take you two years, it may take you seven years like we did for us, but eventually you will, you will if, you, if you are really truly trying to be um, you know, a, a, a husband that, that dies for their wife or, or a wife that, you know, submits to the husband, um, you know, in, in following Christ, then you will get there. It takes time, but you will get sanctified. It's good. It's really good. Yeah. I mean, I think this kind of leads us to the challenges of a second marriage a little bit. Um, I think as we were, well, as you were sharing, I was thinking about 
contracts. I think when you're getting married later in life, like it's like, what kind of are you getting married? Community, out of community, you know, things that you're like excluding and including, and those can become very uncomfortable conversations. Um, I know like round about the time we're getting married, maybe like, you know, five years before, I think this whole thing of like, if you're getting married, show that you're serious, is that you're married in communal property. Like this couple is bringing everything and all their things. You know, and I would say it's just kind of poor counseling, really. Like, um, I mean, I'm saying this, but we did get married in community. Um, <laughs> we're like, we're bringing everything, nothing hidden. Uh, you know, so, but I think when you're getting married later or if it's a sec second marriage, I think it's, you should consider like what's being kept in, what's being kept out. If there are children involved, you want to leave some of the things for your kids. And like, that's not sinful. Like, that's just wisdom. I think we need to yeah, stay away from this thing. We're just like, no, we must just bring everything into the pot and we must figure it out. I'm talking about mainly second marriage. Um, so I think the contract thing, and I mean, even if it's not a second marriage, like if there are things that you've been doing for the past, I don't know, 15 years before you got married and maybe you wanna, you can discuss like, okay, I'm gonna leave this to my family. These investments are going here. I think we need to just be people that are just kind of willing to think about those things and not just, Put them in a pot of like no we don't do this we do that because the bible doesn't say anything about that like i think yeah i think those are fair conversations and let's not make people uncomfortable because we have a preference and we think it might be better yeah a certain way mm. yeah i don't know if you want to add no that's good that's really really good so maybe let me um you've both alluded to it um actually all three of you uh it's clear marriage is not easy it's different for different people um but but maybe if you could, when has it been hard for you? Um, and then I think how did you get out of it? Um, just as a practical, like folks may not go through that, but they could learn something from that. Um, so when when has when has marriage been hard, and how did you get out of it of that difficult season? Um, I think for me, I don't know if this answers your question perfectly, but. I will say, when I first got married, I assumed that I, I knew marriage was difficult just because, you know, I'd seen other people and I knew mm. it was work. But I had no idea. I always thought the problems would come from outside, so that there'd be external problems like, oh, money or family or children or, you know, the economy. But I actually didn't realize that <laughs> that I would be the problem <laughs> and that um, the biggest problem in my marriage would be me, the sinner. And um, yeah, I kept hitting my head against the same sort of wall until I came to that realization. And it's like, oh, I'm the problem. Like, because <laughs> it doesn't matter who I marry, we're gonna still have the same sort of problems. It's it's not really that. Oh, if I if if he changed, like if Bongani stopped doing this, then all our problems would go away. It's like, no, no, you, you are the you are the common denominator in the problems, in the fights, in the whatever. And so sort of getting to the end of myself and realizing, wow, I, I need Jesus. Like, <laughs> I really do just need the Lord to fix me, um, regardless of what he does. Um, I'm the problem and that mm. I'm the person who needs the gospel every day. Um, not just when Jesus saved me, but like every single day. And, you know, that's, it's been really humbling, um, but also sanctifying and it's grown us, I think, mm. as well. Or well, grown me, at least. <laughs> but if I'm growing, then obviously, you know, we're, we're all so growing as a couple. Um, but yeah. yeah, yeah, I think to answer your question, leading up to that point of realization and then God graciously sanctifying me, and he still is, I mean, I'm still a work in progress. So, yeah. That's good. It's really good. Um... You know, the first thing that comes to my mind is this word honeymoon phase. Like, it's kind of a weird term for me. Um, yeah, I think it's what you make of it. Um, because we, I mean, we've always been friends. Um, yeah, literally best friend, honestly. Um, we've spoken about so many things even before getting married. Like, just had a lot of time to just be friends. And so... Walking into marriage is just all the, all the more sweeter, you know, like you already have your friend and you're now navigating all these other new things, but they seem manageable. And then out of nowhere, 
like things are not as sweet, like things are not as easy. And I mean, we have, it was specific, I think it was mid halfway into a marriage. Mm. Um, you couldn't quite pinpoint unless maybe now that we're looking back, we can say mm, there was a lot of things happening, transition with just kind of work responsibilities, uh, family growing, and there's just a lot of expectations and stress coming in. And um, yeah, it's like we're not, things don't feel as easy and as simple. And you're sitting there asking yourself, oh snap, is this how it's going to be for the rest of our marriage? And uh, I think it's something that most marriages face, and I think hence the honeymoon phase situation. It's like, at some point something happens and uh, things are different. Um, and so I think for me, it's when that happened um, in that moment, it's not a question of, oh, I guess, I guess this marriage is done, or, you know, it's, um, it brings back the whole thing of maturity, and that maturity is not, oh, this person carries themselves so grown up and they can do all these things, but it's maturity in your understanding of who Jesus is and who God is and what marriage is. So in that moment, it's not centered on your emotions and your preferences and how you would have liked things to be. It's um, what, does, what does God want, mm. uh, first and foremost? And how do I submit all these emotions that I'm feeling in this time uh, to him and entrust him and trust that he can carry the future, mm. which in that moment you don't know, honestly, because you're like, yeah, this is feeling a bit like a norm. Like this is becoming like, this is our marriage now. And if, if this is my marriage for the next 20 years or until I see Jesus, it's okay. That's a hard thing to say. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, because you want to strive, you want to do things, and you should, right? Like, let's go to marriage counseling, let's do all these things. But what if it never becomes what it was at the beginning? Yeah. How do you submit that to God? And so I think I appreciated the maturity, henceforth, of, uh, uh, there because I was, it was like, no, the question is not, ah, it's not working out. The question is like, God, how do we press in more? Hmm into trusting you with the rest of this covenant is going to become. Mm. And I think we're just uh, going back to what Mongani said, like it's like, um, I think we step out too quickly because it didn't even last a whole year. And it's like, here we are back again. But if we made a decision <clears throat> out of what we were feeling uh, in that time, we would have missed out on so much more that was ahead of us. So. Yeah. yeah, so that was hard. That That's was, uh, we had a hard year. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was tough. Um, and just on that, I think I've, no, no one wakes up having to slay a giant. You just don't. What starts off as a weed or a little, little issue or a little flame, if you don't address it, it just continues to grow and grow and grow and grow. And so what happens, mo most cases is, you know, you turn a corner, someone will come up and say, here's what's happening in our marriage. And it's like, whoa, this is, we're, we're the swords, we're slaying giants now, you know what I mean? We're slaying dragons. And it's like, but that's not where it started. And, and, and I think what's important is um, when those things come up, when those issues come up, please, please, please seek counsel. Like, don't, don't, don't keep quiet. Don't be like, no, we'll, we'll manage this. I've spoken about this before. There's, there's no such thing as sin management. Right? There's no such thing as sin management. Um, you think you're managing it, but you're not. What's happening is that it's just continually growing, growing, growing. And then when we have to slay a dragon, which, which we'll do. There's leaders here. These folks up here, these are, these are dragon slayers. We'll show up. But it's just a lot of work. And it's un and, and unnecessary. Because well, we, we could have pulled out a weed. Oh, that's an issue, no problem. Let's just do that. Da, da, let's carry on. We, but, but when you don't, when you, when you choose to live in isolation, and you can do that in your marriage, you can be lonely in your marriage. If you think your loneliness will be fixed by marriage, I need to let you know, you can be lonely. And in fact, loneliness in marriage is worse. So, so, so I would say reach out. Like It's, it's important to... to to seek counsel and to not let those things become these massive things in your life that are now requiring a whole army um, where two people could have easily come through and helped out. So those, those are super helpful. Um, do, do you want to ask something? What is, what is your greatest fear? 
Because I think in marriage, in relation to marriage, because this is probably something that we don't talk a lot about. Like, and I wonder how many spouses actually look at one another and go, hey, this is my greatest fear. With regards to our marriage, this is my greatest fear. And not allow fear to, to drive you. Um, because the Bible tells us we've not been given a spirit of fear, right? So, so what, are, what, are some, what are some fears? And then maybe even as you talk about that, what are some, if there have been ways that um, you've, you've spoken about it. Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll go, you know, spoke about it actually recently. I'm not in relation to this, just talking about it. My biggest fear is that, um, uh, 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 I'm trying to decide if I should say it the way I say it to you. <laughs> don't say it, okay, okay. So my, my greatest fear is that, is that my wife would leave me because I'm not good enough. And, and the more I dig at it, I realize like it's, it's a deep insecurity and a deep fear of trying to become everything, like trying to become Christ to her that I cannot. And so it crushes me. That's the fear that I feel. And then it, it, it crushes her in the way that like I relate to her because now I'm sensitive. Like I get to the point where it's like I'm not even going to call her out on her sin because I'm afraid. Like if I do that, then she'll leave me. Or, or I work too hard because it's like if I can't, if, I don't, if I'm not able to do X. And it's like, hold on. Like she reminds me that we're in this together. Like this is a together thing. Like, and I like to hear, and I've said this to her, like, I, I love hearing I love you, which is great. But, but I'm not leaving you is, is one of the most powerful things for me. Um, because it helps me, like, conquer that fear. Like, to stare in the face and to be like, she's not leaving me. Um, so, yeah. Sure, that was vulnerable. Um, yeah, I mean, I want to add to that. I think... Yeah, I think it's interesting that we have that dynamic because it's one of the things that I have seen in marriages around me where there's been maybe help needed is when husbands are so aware that their wives are sinful and somebody else calls out that sin, not just calls it out, but tries to help and then they behave like they didn't know the sin and they're like defending their wives. Guys, it's bad. So I don't know if that comes from a place of maybe a similar place of like, Gotta, I've got to be on my wife's side, but it's like with sin, really? So I think um, I just want to say, brothers, be courageous, be brave. Mm. You're not helping your wife when you know fully well that she's in sin mm. and you're out here pretending like you can't see it. Mm. Like, it's, it's not good discipleship or leadership. I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. Um, mine would be, my fear would be, when are dying? Yeah. So that's, because I'm very practical, I think a lot about the future, I try to plan as much as I can. Uh, so his way of helping me, the same way that I would remind him that I'm not going anywhere. I think this guy doesn't know I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere, guys. Uh, but anyway, but for, for us would be to, I mean, death is a reality. Uh, one that we, no one wants to think about. Like we, we, we don't know when we're gonna be with Christ. So you don't want to think about it a lot and live in that fear and be, and be paralyzed by it. But you can do some things that, you know, help. Like, so be like, as someone who lost their parents, well, that's Oni, when he was young, it's like, what are some of the things that you wish your dad would have done or prepared or, and as much as you can, you can never prepare for death. And so it's for him to like put stuff in place, make sure there's people that are, where do you go, who you talk to, financially, da, 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 all of that stuff, like all of those things are in place because that's just life. Um, so that you're only grieving specifically the person if that ever happens and you're not like, oh my gosh, now I need to one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. So yeah, but that's a big fear yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, I think my fear is I don't think I've actually shared this with you. I think my fear is more in relation to our children. So, I don't actually how to put this in English. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, just because I'm aware that the kids are always watching us and learning from us. Um, I don't know, like I, I just, so maybe backtrack. I remember one day, so my parents, um, they fought a lot in their marriage, like bickering and stuff. 
And one day my mom came to me and it used to annoy me and my siblings all the time. And my mom came to me one day and she was like, you know, I really don't want our marriage, how it is at the moment, to discourage you from getting married mm. one day. And it's kind of sat with me for, you know, sort of, it comes, it pops up in, again every now and then. But I really, I have this sort of fear that the kids would not just reject marriage, but reject Christ based on our marriage. Like, mm. what if they see us and they go, well, ugh, I don't want to worship this God that, look at their marriage, look at their lives. Like, why would I want to submit to a God who's got people like this following him? Or why would I even want to get married? Like, what's the point? Um, so I'm just, yeah, that's something that I, mm. I constantly have to be like, sort of taking to God and be like, hey God, can you please, I know salvation is a God thing and, you know, just to trust in him for our kids' salvation and that they would want to live lives mm. worthy of the name Christian, you know, of Christ um, and sort of leaving that in God's hands and obviously not in a way to absolve us from any responsibility, like we should be um, living out our marriage in a way that does like what Pastor said in the beginning, like your marriage should really show Christ and the church. So I'm not mm. saying that I want to, you know, be like, oh, well, you know, it's all up to God and what he does. But it's just this fear, like, oh, what if they're looking and they're watching and what if, you know, we put them off Christ and put them off marriage? So that's something that I'm constantly, yeah, um, yeah taking to God and uh, to, with, and you're yeah, working. Yeah, I mean, maybe... I mean, no, no one prays for our kids more than my wife. I mean, she, like, in tears, like, she, for, their, for their salvation, like, literally. I mean, I pray for them, but, you know, she <laughs> prays for them. <laughs> so, I, th I think we, I see it, they see it, I think we all see it. Mm. Maybe we haven't, like, uh, yeah, we, maybe we haven't discussed it specifically, but we see it, we see the actions. Mm. You know, she, Mulebukhen prays for the children, like, she, by name, in tears, like, I, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, and I and I guess it's because of the you know the background that you have as, as you explained, um, yeah. So that's I just wanted to commend you. Like mm, we see it. Beautiful. It's not uh, beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's not invisible. Um, I, I think mine is is a little bit different. Like my, my fear is that I would get drawn away from her. So it's more like an inward thing in me, right? To go like I would look upon some some someone else or something else and mm. go that's my bride now. And, and, and not her, mm. um, you know, because we live in such a world now where, you know, I don't know, man, it's, the, the world is, is an interesting place. I mean, you, you were saying leave married people alone. I think that's kind of like a, it's a real thing. Mm. Um, you know, where, where I am, I'm not going to talk about myself, but, you know, I'm recognizable in public spaces and that can often come with challenges, right? I mean, I don't, um, and I know there's someone, I don't go to like the gym anymore. I, I don't do that. Um, both for, for multiple reasons, both my, me and, and also like I'll have my own gym and I go to my own one because for me, that's way more helpful. Um, you know, so I think there's, there, there, there's that temptation, but also seeking from the world. Uh, and I fear like one day you get pulled away and, and you're no longer kind of like, you know, um, you know, focus on your bride. So, so that's, that's my fear. Yeah. And, and I guess the way I'm working through that, you know, because we don't live in fear, is just to avoid spaces. I mean, I, who do I hang out with? I hang out with you. <laughs> you know, like, I hang out with you guys. You know, I, you know what, are the, what are the reasons why I play golf? Is, is For me, it's a pastime where there are only men. I mean, I know women play golf, but generally there's only men. And, and if, if my wife phones me, I'm, I'm like 500 meters away. Like, I don't go anywhere else. I don't go out. Like, I, you know, my clubhouse is pretty much my club as well. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> because, you know, I'm 500 meters away from her. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, you know. So that, that's my fear. Yeah. I hope you're hearing that, that, like, this is in the category of fight for your marriage. So at all costs, like, you can't. Knowing your fears is important because then you can address them. Knowing your temptations is important because you can address them. You can secure and protect and like because because the enemy is after your marriage. Yeah. Like if you didn't know that, you, now you know. Leave this place knowing that the enemy is after your marriage because he hates marriage because he hates God. 
And so we do everything we can and be as open and as transparent and vulnerable as you can with your spouse on these things. Real, let's wrap up here a little bit. Um, I want to ask this one. Uh, look, I understand marriages are different. Okay, Mar- All marriages are different. People do different things. Um, but there are some unhelpful practices that we've seen in other people's marriages. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to say we've learned them. Uh, very few we've done. Very few. Very few. But we've seen them in other people. Uh, and to be honest, they may not be sinful. These aren't sinful things. But they're just unhelpful to a flourishing marriage. Um, I don't know. It might be helpful just to share some of those. Um, maybe by way of example. Um, this my phone and you, have, you cannot have access to my phone, and you're not allowed to, in my phone, is, I don't understand it. Um, because your phone is, is probably one of the most dangerous things you have in your possession, other than your own heart. <laughs> and, and so I see people who be like, yo, my wife, my wife has, doesn't have access to my phone. You know what I mean? I have a password that she does. No, you're not allowed on my phone. It's, I just feel like that's super unhelpful. Um, because usually you're hiding things in your phone and, and you shouldn't be hiding anything from your, your covenant um, person. So that's, that's one thing that I've seen that I'm just like, and, and if that's you, um, I'm happy to have a conversation about it and you can try to convince me on why. <laughs> All the best. Um, because in that moment, I might go, can you give me your phone? Let me take a look. Let me look at your Instagram. Let me look at what, who you're following. Like, let me... Let me look at your messages. Let me look at your... And if you go, no, I'm a little uncomfortable with that, then it's like, okay. So I feel like that's unhelpful. Do you guys have any other things that you've seen? Maybe you've... Uh, you went deep there. <laughs> I, just don't, I just don't like that Their one. phone. It's a weed. Hey. But then it, it grows to become... The phone is part of people. It's part and parcel of who they are. But anyway, um, I think when you said that, it reminded me of... Um, Money, like when you don't know one another's salaries. There are people who are married who don't know what the other one makes. It's not sinful, but unhelpful. Uh, yeah, it's like, yeah, I don't know, I'd say that one. There's no pressure to have one. Yeah, no, there's so many. I'm trying to pick oh, one. Great. <laughs> great. Put them all out there. Uh, bickering. Bickering doesn't help. I saw that in my own parents' marriage and even mm. ours. I, I actually, I brought the bickering into the marriage, which is not helpful because you actually kind of forget all the good stuff that your spouse mm. does or that your spouse has. Like, it sucks the joy out of the marriage. Um, yeah, so don't do that. <laughs> Trust me. Um, yeah, okay, no, you go. Um, unhelpful things. I think not... not not taking care of your bodies, hmm. I think, is unhelpful. Zin, zin, zin. <laughs> um, you know, because there's so, so, I mean, and it's a criticism that I've, I've, I've heard my family side mostly throw at her. Because if you're an African man, if you get married, you get bigger, and, you know, like, I've heard that. I don't know if it's true, but I've heard that. And, and people were getting like, are you not cooking for him? You know, like, are you not? I'm like, no, guys, we, we, we are we're actually trying to, you know, take care of our bodies and, and she's trying to cook healthy and, and all of those things and, and same for her. So, so yeah, I would, I would watch that because I think, look, image is not everything. So we don't get married only for looks. But at the same time, we don't go out of our way to, you know, look as horrible as we can. Because, you know, <laughs> Revelation 19. <laughs> We're given fine linen to wear. <laughs> Just say it. So. Are we getting new bodies, Mwani? <laughs> We're getting new bodies in heaven. <laughs> but for now, you have this one. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, no, I want to add there. I mean, obviously, I agree. Like, that's, that's, yeah. that's all true. Like, you don't even, we kind of spoke about it even last week. Like, I think taking care of ourselves is you being a good steward. Um, you know, a counter one that one could be feeling is um, I've heard of spouses where um, they can't be intimate anymore because of the body changes that have happened. That's not helpful. Mm. I think if there are concerns, 
in the marriage about health or about the image. I think helping your spouse, like working together to get to that ideal place that you as a family prefer is more important than just kind of like rejecting the other person. Mm. So, yeah. It's good. It's good. Maybe let me wrap our time up. I um, actually don't even know what time it is. Yo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're going to sing um, at the end. But let me ask this question and I'll close this. Um, how do you cultivate a healthy, flourishing marriage? Like, what are just some practical things um, that you can do for folks to, to hear that cultivate a healthy, flourishing marriage? Okay. Um, I mean, th th there's the obvious things. Pray together, read the word together. Um, I, I just think we don't, you know, like... It, it, I'm, I'm talking more from us, part of the things that we've learned. It's just like doing stuff together. Like have something that you do together, whether it's going out or dating or like running together or, or something like that. Um, we just find for us it, it grows intimacy. Mm. Uh, you know, so you can, you can grow intimacy, you know, just by doing things together and spending more time together. Um, I think being more deliberate in that uh, is very helpful. Um, you know, you can't spend all your time with your friends, like I'm sorry to say. Um, you know, your friends are important, but they're not that important compared to your bride or your mm -hmm. spouse. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so having things that you do together as a couple, and preferably things you both enjoy, but it doesn't always have to be the case. So, for example, my wife is into dance, and, you know, so, yes, I, I, I try and do it, but I'm really horrible. Um, but we can run together, and, and, that's, and that's really lovely, so... I think when times do get tough, because they will, because we live in a fallen world, I think it's uh, like just something that kind of helped me as well with the praying and reading the Bible and praying together. And also just remember sort of why you got married to begin with, why you fell in love with that person to begin with. Um, yeah, sometimes we forget how wonderful our spouses are. Um, you get so bogged down with life and their sin, your sin, the kids sin, other people sin, everybody, everybody's sinning. Oh, it's just, it's just, it's a mess sometimes. And it's just nice to just go back and go, hey man, remember, these are the qualities that I love about my husband. This is what makes him so great. Um, he's a great father. Like, remind yourself of the positive things. Because um, life will want to bring you down and and the devil will want to only remind you of the sin, only remind you of the bad things. But there's so much that is so good in Christ and he you know, he wants to give us all of that and he does that in, in a large way in our spouses. So yeah. Amen. Say so two things for me. Um, first one would be honesty. Um, I think just being honest with one another with where you are, how you're feeling, um, and also just about things that are coming in, whether it's family, whether it's needs from family members or friends or anyone, like just being, I'm going to talk to my husband. I know people hate that, that, that line. It's like, can't you think for yourself? You know, you're no longer an individual. No, I have a husband and we are deciding things together. So I'm going to go talk to my husband and then we'll let you know what we're going to do. Um, so, yeah, just being honest, because, I mean, yeah, otherwise you're getting texts on the side, quickly take out from this pot, don't tell your husband, you're going to, you know, don't do that stuff. It's small things, you know, but they, they add up, yes. Um, the second thing is um, just be committed to your own walk with Jesus. Okay. You know, I think we say it week in, week out, uh, the expectations we can have on one another can be very crushing. So if you are not leaning in your relationship with God, you are going to have expectations on your spouse that they will not be able to meet. And it's so unfair. Um, and so commit to, when you're growing in Christ, when you are intimate with Christ, we're close to Christ, both of you doing the same thing, both moving in the same direction. So yeah, I encourage that. Do you have something? Because you need to answer this whole tie question before yeah, we close. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. wrap it up with this. Right. Is that, is that That's okay it. for? Um, so the, I would just, yeah, all of those, brilliant. I would say um, um, figure out your boundaries as a, as a married couple because um, that's, that's your defense line. 
Um, that's where you fight the battle from, uh, from the outside. Um, I think, yeah, transparency, vulnerability. Find married people that you can be honest with, um, that you trust, and, uh, and that love Jesus <laughs> more than they love you. Um, <laughs> Because you don't realize that in them loving Jesus more than they love you, they actually love you really well. Yeah. And, um, and in that, that space, you can talk about, here's a great, uh, it's a great indicator that we always kind of have. We'll go, um, you come, you sit down, I'm going through X, Y, Z. We go, great, how's your sex life? I'm not saying that that is always kind of the indicator, but it's very helpful to figure out like, okay, what's going on here? What? Because we, we, we want to withhold. When, we're, when something's happening, we want to withhold. I want to withhold intimacy. I want to withhold relationship. I want to withhold conversation. Um, and that's not helpful. And, and so if you can say, hey, man, here's where we are. Here's what we're going through. Can you, so find those spaces. And there's a lot of spaces here that are like that, um, incredible spaces that are like that. There's a lot of misconceptions here because we are complementarian. There's a misconception that like our wives are like, oh, you know, they just, the men just, no, no, no. These are some tough women up here. Really tough. True story. Like, really tough. Um, and they'll say their peace. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're women who also love marriage. They love God. And, and they want to see this flourish, not just here, but beyond the walls of this space. Um, so I wanted to say that. I'll say this real quick, and then we'll be done. We're not going to sing band, don't worry. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll, you know, because of time, people. Some people have roasts in the oven, and I'm always concerned <laughs> about your roast. So I'll close with a benediction. But there's a question here that came about soul ties. Um, is there such a thing as soul spiritual ties between people uh, who have sex but are not married? Um, I kind of understand where this is coming from um, because, you know, whether it's language like the two becoming one that we see in Genesis and that Jesus brings up, whether it's uh, Paul talking about it in terms of sexual immorality, um, that that's sin. There's a sin outside the body, sin uh, within the body. So I get what people are saying. Uh, here's the thing. Let me up front say this. Soul ties does not, like that phrase doesn't exist in the Bible. It's not there. Um, and, and so it's us trying to make sense of what we are reading. Um, and that's okay. The problem is when you take it too far and away from God uh, and you create something that it almost like grace cannot cover, then we're in trouble, right? So it's soul ties. I've heard people say this. Soul ties because you've had sex with someone who's not you're not married to, and now you carry that person with you. I'm like, I get what you're saying. Um, there are things that are carried. There's experiences. There's things that you're going to have to work through. Um, but you need to understand that when God forgives, He forgives. Yeah. He wipes the slate clean. That's, that's, that's God's forgiveness. We remember, but He tells us that, like, I'll remember it no more. Yeah. Um, so that's important to understand. But, but yes, the, 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 if you want to talk about soul time, yes, one flesh, Genesis 1. You might even go a little bit to 1 Samuel um, uh, 18, uh, Jonathan and David. Uh, their friendship, it's spoken there that, that like it was, their friendship was so deep, it was like their souls were knitted together, right? Now, that's communicating the depth of their friendship, which is what I spoke about last week, that there is an intimacy that can be experienced in friendship that God gives us. But it's not, it's, it's not to take it to the place where we're saying like, okay, now we're tied together and that's it, you know, and uh, there's a third wheel if we get married. It's like, no, that's not, that's not how it works. That's, that's, that doesn't exist. Um, it's language that Christians and the church has used to try to make sense of this. But I need you to know, if, if that's you, if you're sitting here and you've gone, I've had sex with someone and I'm not married to them, what does this mean for me? Well, you repent, you come to Jesus, the blood of Jesus covers you, you are forgiven, the slate is wiped clean and you begin again. It's a beautiful thing that God yeah. gives us. A beautiful thing. Amen. And so I, I just wanted to communicate that um, right at the end. Friends, we've been here way too long. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, um, can you give our panelists a round of... Thank you. We're done. Yeah, yeah you guys can go sit. Thank you so much. Um, here's what I'm going to do. Um, literally, we are, we are out of time. Um, and, uh, no, let me not... Let me not no, Sydney. I mustn't even give an option. That's the problem. Let them vote. Let them vote. No, that never ends well. Um, we might have to have a, 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 a united <laughs> forming coalitions here, Ru. It's like, well. Okay, then we'll see. And then the band can come up. If you need to go, then you can go. So here's what I'm going to do. Band, come up. We're going to sing. We're going to close in song. Um, I believe the song we're singing is Good, Good Father. Is that correct? Are we? Yeah, okay, great. Um, 
and I think it's appropriate that, um, that God is a good father. Uh, he's, he's a good father who gives good gifts, and one of those gifts is marriage. Um, he gives us a number of gifts, but one of them is marriage. And, um, and you might be sitting here and going, Man, my marriage doesn't, doesn't feel good. Um, you might be going through a really tough time. Um, you might be wrestling with a lot of things. Maybe you're not married and you're wanting to be married, but you're realizing, wow, I've got a ton of issues that I still need to navigate through. No problem. And the reason I can say no problem is because the one who is sit- seated on the throne is a good father. Um, he is able to meet you where you are and, and help you, help you come out of whatever situation that you're in. Like if you're, your marriage is, is, is you're, you're almost like you're five two, like I'm done. God's not done with you. He's not done with your marriage. He can restore. He can reconcile. He can bring it back to a place of flourishing. If you're sitting here and you've been divorced and you're just like, what does this mean for me now? I want you to know that the blood of Jesus covers. The blood of Jesus heals. That God loves you more than you could ever imagine. That your identity is not the fact that you are a divorcee. No, your identity is that you're a child of God. There is more grace in Jesus than sin in you. And God can do some amazing things as he heals you and then sets you up for whatever it is that he has for you. So we're going to sing about this good father. I want you to sit in it for a moment. Just sit in it for a moment. Not seated where you are. We're going to stand in response. But but just for a moment, just like, let this be more than just words on a screen. And then for those who eventually get to that point of singing, let us sing it like we mean it. Like he is a good father. Let me close with this. We'll be done. When the band wraps up, we'll be done. Let me close in benediction. Proverbs chapter 3, not just, it's not speaking primarily of marriage, but it includes marriage and includes everything else. And here's what God's word says. Proverbs 3, verse 3 and 4 says, Never let loyalty and faithfulness leave you. Tie them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favor and high regard with God and people. And so, Father God, we thank you that we can only be faithful because you remain faithful. We can only be loyal because you are loyal. And so would you do a mighty work in us, in each and every one of us, regardless of where we find ourselves, God, would you meet us where we are and would we be blown away by the grace that is found in Jesus. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Friends, let's stand and respond to our good father.